Yesterday was a fun day for me personally. While I was waiting to pick up Bright New Worlds director and doctoral researcher Ben Hurd at the Cologne Bonn Airport, I met Lamen B. Deba, Minister of Forestry, Environment, Climate Change and Natural Resources, and spoke with him about Gambia's plight for sustainability. When Ben finally arrived, we went to meet up with Generation Atomic to have some interesting conversations. While we were driving from the airport to Bonn, we had some pretty interesting insights, and one of them is that nuclear isn't dead at all. Ben was being a bit tentative, and and understandably so. We are all prone to some bias, after all. But here is the lowdown on how we got to this conclusion. France backs off on their intent to stop using nuclear power because it's incompatible with their goals of decarbonizing. In fact, they already are decarbonized by a great degree and become aware of this just now, which is strange because they have had nuclear power for decades. Poland has committed to building nuclear power plants and gradually phase out their coal-burning facilities. Rolls-Royce recently presented a new small modular reactor concept. Switzerland has augmented their reactors to include load-following capabilities. Terrestrial Energy, a Canadian molten salt reactor startup, has just passed an essential pre-licensing milestone, meaning that we are one tangible step closer towards the commercialization of the integral molten salt reactor. And do note that they are currently in pole position. Given the robust nature of their organization and the intent with which they move forward, it is highly likely that they will finish first. The Russian nuclear giant, Rosatom, is selling reactors like cookies, particularly in the Arabian Peninsula, but also with strong possibilities in Africa and Asia. China is finishing their first AP-1000, Sandman 1. And that's it for this brief list of positive things happening in the nuclear world. The only thing we may note is that the EU and the US have some catching up to do. No more and no less. We need to rethink our regulatory strategies. We need to rethink nuclear as a whole. In the meanwhile, the rest of the world is forging ahead into a new era of nuclear power. Many people claim that there is no nuclear renaissance. That's only true as long as you view the EU and the US as the center of the world, which in effect lags behind the rest of the world. Let's talk necessity. It's not only that nuclear is not dead, but also that it is required to solve climate change. I'm not going to re-examine everything. I'm going to point you out to some actualities. As is needed, I would even say required, Academics are always tentative and cautious. And when I say that the 100% WWS roadmap of Jacobson has been refuted, those with those who are familiar with it agree, but also always tentatively add, well, we might still be wrong. But for all intents and purposes, we may call it refuted, and it should be retracted. I won't claim credit for it though, but do know that I know the roadmap intimately and have written a comprehensive, non-academic, yet well-sourced critique. But the real heavy hits came from Ben Hurd and Christopher Clack. But the real heavy hitters came from Ben Hurd and Christopher Clack, who wrote articles respectively called The Burden of Proof and evaluation of a proposal for reliable low-cost grid power 
with 100% wind, water, and solar. Most important was the observation a friend of mine made, and I am not going to name him, not because I want credit for it, but because it is relevant, and given the current state of affairs, I won't do things that hurt others in their plight against Jacobson's nonsense. His observation, Jacobson has now built an entire business around his WWS thesis and managed to attach wealthy individuals to it like DiCaprio, Ruffalo and Bill Nye, but also many more. If his thesis fails, their business falters. Now, there's always the possibility of there being a strong confirmation bias that keeps these people from dropping Jacobson. But the entire idea behind the so-called Solutions Project, which is basically a strong lobby for a misguided form of environmentalism, is faulty. And it serves only to put us on the backtrack as it purposefully and actively seeks to end nuclear power in the process. I said this earlier, and I repeat, if Jacobson is aware of the mathematical, physical, and geological arguments against his thesis, and he tries to sweep them under the rug, then he is a morally reprehensible person. To show you that he is the opposite of a true academic, let me show you his modus operandi. If you are a simple, concerned, but well-informed person and question him directly, he will deflect by saying that you are not an academic and he shouldn't have to listen to you. In fact, he will block you, as has happened to me. If you are an academic but not in the energy or climate change field and you challenge him, he will deflect by saying that you've not produced any research papers on the project on the subject and he will dismiss anything you say out of hand, even if you have evidence to support your claim. But worst of all, if you are an academic with expertise on energy matters and have published multiple peer-reviewed papers and you challenge him, backed up with more than 20 expert peers, he will fabricate a situation in which he determines the untruths makes them known, demands your paper to become retracted, and if that doesn't happen, he will try to coerce a retraction by filing a civil lawsuit. It's not based on the contents of the paper, by the way. It's based on the fact that he claimed that there were untruths and turns it into a libel case. Let it be known that the paper written by Clack et al. is probably the best refutation to Mark C. Jacobson's own faulty fabrication and exposes the flaws with pinpoint precision. The lawsuit doesn't change a thing about it. On a more optimistic note, let's consider the work of Michael Schallenberger, the Director of Environmental Progress. He has been zipping around the globe to keep countries from veering off course. He's had success in South Korea, where a referendum has thwarted the government's plans to try a to try a shutdown of their nuclear industry, which would be an incredible shame as South Korea is one of the world leaders in terms of building new state-of-the-art reactors and maintaining an excellently operating fleet of nuclear facilities. He also traveled to Germany to attend COP23 together with James Hansen and also remains active in the US. One of the focal points being the Diablo Canyon nuclear power plant, one of the best kept nuclear facilities on the face of the planet, planned to be shut down at 2025, which is premature. This is entirely unwarranted and it would set back the local economy in San Luis Obispo County, but also deprive the state of California of millions of kilowatt hours of carbon free and reliable energy. Rauli Pogtanen wrote an article called Decarbonizing Cities, Helsinki Metropolitan Area, where he explains how one can create fuel, heat and electricity for an entire city using advanced new nuclear reactors. And finally, Energy for Humanity published the European Climate Leadership Report. Please check out all of these articles and groups. They are quintessential in our fight to keep low-carbon, environmentally sound energy on the table. 
I'll reiterate, energy for humanity, environmental progress, generation atomic, and bright new world. You will find links in the description below. Thank you for watching and don't forget to subscribe and share this video.